um, Sydney, I think I'll turn it over to you for the public comment section. That's right. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I would like to make a quick announcement. If you wish to provide public comments, please use the raise hand feature located in the reactions tab on the menu bar. Public comments will be addressed in the order in which they are received. Each commenter has three minutes to provide their comment. A countdown timer will be displayed to indicate how much time you have remaining. If you are not selected today for public comment due to the comment period closing on the agenda, please don't hesitate to send your written public comment to the HICPAC um, inbox, H-I-C-P-A-C at cdc.gov. Your comment will be published in the HICPAC meeting minutes. And please note that the public comment period is not a question and answer session. I'll hand it over to our Zoom coordinator to get started with um, those who are raising their hands and to um, unmute them and call them by name. Paul Hennessy, you are now able to talk for public comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm just a member of a, the public, no affiliation. I want to talk about clean indoor air. Uh, this is the most effective tool for fighting a wide variety of airborne illnesses, and it will help with patients and medical staff alike. The CDC in HICPAC does not acknowledge the importance and function of control, core control measures for infectious aerosols. Wearing respirators and having ventilated clean indoor air and air filtration reduces transmission of not just COVID, but also RSV, flu, and common cold and more. Notice I said respirators. N95 respirators offer better protection than surgical masks. All masks are not created equal. Respirators must remain in healthcare on top of improved indoor air quality. Any future airborne illnesses or pandemics will also be helpless against ventilation, respirators, and air filtration. Ventilation protects the vaccinated and unvaccinated alike. We cannot risk death, disablement, or even disruption when a simple answer is right in front of us. Failing to do so is the equivalent of not wearing gloves or washing your hands. It is incredibly dangerous to ignore this. There are currently no recommendations on ventilation, which is absurd. The proposed use of airborne infection isolation rooms or other approaches to isolation is far too limited. Ventilation works against all variants of COVID, which is extremely transmissible and airborne. Ventilation and air filtration also helps workers be more alert, which improves air quality and the quality of work. We must go above and beyond with these safety precautions. The benefits of clean indoor air are tremendous. If I, a member of the public, can easily figure out how viral transmission works and how respirators and ventilation help, surely you can too. You are ignoring decades of research. On top of that, your work group on the isolation precautions only recommends the bare minimum of protection and allows healthcare workers to create isolation control plan. This is unacceptable because in the past, it allowed employers to avoid protecting employees because they didn't want to spend more money. Healthcare is more important than profit. I urge the CDC and HICPAC to increase transparency in public engagement because of situations like this. We deserve input on protecting ourselves from airborne infectious diseases. The current process is flawed and closed off. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your, for your comments. You can move on to the next. Deborah Gold, it is now your turn for public comment. Hi, um, my name is Deborah Gold, and thank you for the opportunity to provide some brief comments on behalf of Cal OSHA, California's OSHA state plan. I also refer you to the May 31st letter from our Deputy Chief Eric Berg and the July letter signed by 900 public health experts. We are seriously concerned about the lack of transparency and openness in this process. Despite repeated requests, we have not seen a draft of the proposed guidelines. We have not seen the minutes of working groups or even of the previous meeting and, of, and working group meetings have not been advertised or open to the public. If we learn nothing from the tremendous illness and loss of life during the past three years of the COVID crisis, it is how important it is that public health recommendations be clear and strong enough to protect both individual workers and patients and the healthcare system as a whole. At various points in the pandemic, we have seen massive personnel and equipment shortages that put lives at risk. As with Cal OSHA, the CDC process must include all stakeholders, including affected workers, their unions, and experts from various disciplines, and must be publicly transparent. 
California OSHA has an aerosol transmissible disease standard, which requires that novel, path no novel respiratory pathogens be considered airborne for the purpose of employee protection, including the use of respirators. But repeatedly, employers have ignored these requirements and claimed that they were confused by CDC guidelines. This has resulted in a very resource-intensive enforcement effort by Cal OSHA to ensure that at least minimum protections to healthcare for the healthcare workforce. Insufficiently protected workers and the facilities in which they work have suffered unnecessarily and many still do. It is important that public health messaging be consistent and that the CDC establish credibility if we are to control communicable disease. Public health message consistency must be based on protecting workers and the public and not be the result of demands for unquestioning loyalty to weak and unprotective guidelines. We are a state OSHA program. We rely on NIA certified respirators to protect ourselves and the workers of California. The CDC must not undermine respiratory protection regulation by making the false and misleading claim that there is no difference in protection between respirators which are designed and independently certified to protect against inhalation of small particle aerosols and surgical masks, which do not. We do not rely on randomized controlled trials to, to require certified respirators for workers exposed to lead, asbestos, and other harmful aerosols, and it would be unethical to do so. Personal protective equipment is only part of reducing transmission in healthcare facilities and other congregate environments. We saw COVID-19 blaze through health facilities and prisons because they lacked effective means of isolation and comprehensive infection control programs. The little we have seen of the draft guideline does not include a thorough discussion of isolation and does not include early identification and isolation of infected people. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for your comment. Yanir Baryab, it is now your turn for public comment. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. My name is Yanir Baryab. I am professor and president of the New England Complex Systems Institute and a co-founder of the World Health Network. We are concerned about proper infection prevention in healthcare. Since there are many more people here than time for comments allows, we will be hosting a recorded Zoom on Thursday, August 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern time for anyone who wants to comment. HICPAC members are welcome and we will make the recordings available to HICPAC and the public. This will ensure that more voices are heard on this critical topic. You can sign up at whn.global slash HICPAC comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yanir, for your comment. We can move on to the next one. Liv Grace is now your turn for public comment. My name is Liv Grace. I'm 36 and physically disabled as well as chronically ill. I have a number of autoimmune diseases, including lupus, and I already live with many of the conditions associated with long COVID, such as POTS, lung disease, and kidney disease. Additionally, I'm immunodeficient on top of the immunosuppression from my lupus medication. I'm also a cancer survivor. People often comment that I live with so much illness and they say how hard that must be, but what is many times more difficult is being unable to safely access medical care. Last December, I caught RSV from my infusion center because my nurse who knew she had been exposed to RSV refused to wear an N95. That turned into pneumonia. Two weeks after recovering and returning to my infusions, I caught COVID there just a few days before my birthday in February after two months of recovery time from pneumonia. I then caught COVID a second time while getting necessary post COVID blood work in April, barely after covering from February's infection. One way N95 masking is not enough for me. I have not gotten medical care since April because of the reality that I will get sick again as long as medical providers refuse to practice respiratory hygiene. I attempted many times to implement ADA accommodations that would allow me to wait in my car rather than the waiting rooms and would require medical staff to wear an N95 while treating me. Over and over again, medical establishments refused. My appeals were rejected. I was told that it was impossible to accommodate my needs as a high risk, severely immunocompromised person. 
I am still recovering from back-to-back -back COVID. I now suffer from increased kidney issues and new heart issues. I had to start taking a blood thinner and a statin to reduce my risk for a catastrophic cardiovascular event. Without medical care, my health will deteriorate to the point of needing hospitalization, where I will have even more exposure to unmasked staff. This is a catch-22. Either access care and catch COVID and other dangerous to me infections to the point of further endangering my life, or do not get care at all and endanger my life. The evidence review on N95 respirator and surgical mask effectiveness was flawed and must be redone with input from scientific researchers and ex experts in respiratory protection, aerosol science, and occupational health. This is eugenics. I'm Jewish and I see the writing on the wall, the history of not only the Holocaust, but many genocides, including the ongoing genocide of indigenous people target disabled people first. I am literally begging for something to be done. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Liv. Grace, we can move on to the next comment. Caitlin Sedling, it is now your turn for public comment. Hello, my name is Caitlin Sundling. I'm a physician, scientist, and pathologist in Wisconsin. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm a member of the People's CDC. I'm speaking today in support of universal masking in healthcare, ideally with broad use of well-fitting N95 or better respirators as a new addition to standard precautions. Now is the time to use what we've learned from HIV and bloodborne pathogens, matching our understanding of the science of aerosol transmission to our precautions in healthcare allows us to work to build public trust and destigmatize aerosol transmitted infectious diseases, especially where asymptomatic transmission is common, as with COVID. Denying the well proven science of N95 respirators would be a significant step backwards. There is no physical basis to support the idea that different aerosol pathogens travel different distances. Appropriate isolation for known or suspected aerosol pathogen infections of any kind, including COVID, must include N95 respirators at minimum and appropriate ventilation controls. I want to share a couple of experiences where universal airborne precautions would have prevented exposure from my own work as a pathologist and as medical director of a health professional training program. While I was in my fellowship training at a well-known Boston hospital, I found out I had been exposed to tuberculosis when I had performed a small biopsy of a neck lymph node on a patient who, as far as we knew, lacked any symptoms or history that would have caused us to suspect the infection. More recently, one of my students was also exposed to tuberculosis on a lung biopsy procedure where cancer had been the suspected diagnosis. If we only protect ourselves against known or certain exposures, we put both patients and workers at risk. We need to expand, not reduce, and the use of N95 or better respiratory protection, including elastomeric respirators with source control and PAPRs in healthcare settings. Lastly, and most importantly, we have a duty to protect our patients. I've had multiple people in my community ask if I, as a pathologist and laboratory-based clinician, can be their primary care provider. It is incredibly sad to me that so few of my fellow healthcare providers are wearing masks to protect themselves and their patients, and some are not even willing to mask upon request. Where providers are masking, our patients, including those who are immunocompromised, still face unmasked waiting rooms and other spaces with shared air. Should patients have to ask their surgeon to wear sterile gloves? Putting the burden of protection on patients is not an appropriate infection control approach. In conclusion, I call on you, members of the CDC's HICPAC committee, to recommend universal masking in healthcare, ideally with the broad use of well-fitting N95 or better respirators as a new addition to standard precautions. Thank you. Lynn, thank you for your comment. Gwendolyn Hill, it is now your turn for public comment. Hello, my name is Gwendolyn Hill and I'm a full-time student at the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as a research intern at Cedar sinai Medical Center. I have now had three confirmed cases of COVID despite my best efforts to avoid infection. And my most recent infections have resulted in long-term symptoms such as gastrointestinal issues, trouble breathing, heart palpitations, and chest pain, all of which require me to go to the hospital. 
Before COVID, I had been extremely active with no standing health problems. Now I fear even more for my, for my health as Los Angeles County has dropped the mask mandate in healthcare as of August 11th. Myself and my friends and family have been actively avoiding going to the hospital to receive the care we need because we cannot risk another COVID infection or any other respiratory infection. And when I put in requests for providers to wear N95s, they get denied. Unfortunately, as a student of, at UCLA, I cannot put my life on hold. I am forced to go into classrooms where no one is masking, forced to choose between my career and my health. At the very least, I expect healthcare facilities to be taking the utmost precautions to prevent healthcare acquired infections. The United States Environmental Protection Agency recognizes that COVID is spread through aerosolized particles. Therefore, standard precautions due to transmission by air should involve universal high quality well-fitting N95 masks, frequent testing, proper ventilation, air cleaning and purifying technology, isolation and other PPE. As you suggested during the meeting, the fewer individual risk assessments that each person has to do, the better. People need to be able to trust that the guidelines in place ensure their safety. The standard precautions you provided today in the meeting mentioned a risk assessment with use of appropriate PPE based on activity. However, although you can claim that one might not always need to wear gloves if their duties are just sitting at a computer, everybody shares the activity of breathing. Healthcare facilities are where some of the most vulnerable people of our population have to frequent or stay. It is the responsibility of HICPAC and the CDC to ensure on a federal level that healthcare facilities are taking the aforementioned steps to reduce COVID transmission and help ensure that people are not leaving sicker than they came. As the committee understands, once rules are put into place, they become habitual practice for people. Our bodies are fueling the COVID variants that continue to emerge. When COVID is copying itself inside millions of people unchecked, it continues to harm and people and, ex and place extreme strain on our healthcare system. I urge HICPAC and the CDC to take in these public comments and perspectives with open minds and to open further meetings for public comment and for public input. The people are telling you exactly what needs to be done to protect us and I urge you to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Gwendolyn, for your comment. You move on to the next comment. Nathaniel Narod, it is now your turn for public comment. Hello, can you hear me? We can. I'm Nathaniel Narod. I spoke previously, my partner at a previous meeting, my partner was infected by doctor's offices twice where they were wearing surgical masks. Um, she has not been infected anywhere else. I have not been infected because I used respirator masks at home. Respirator masks work as everyone else has said. So I'd like to talk about something else. I'm a professional investor with over 30 years of experience. Using respirator masks will be profitable for any hospital or doctor who's using them. A fully reusable P100 respirator, which lasts for years, costs about $40 retail. Versus if a nurse inquires an airborne infection at work and is out sick for one day, that costs thousands of dollars. If the nurse is so sick they can't work anymore, that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. When a patient is infected, and you've already heard about several, that creates liability costs for the hospital in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but worse, it creates a reputational issue. As you've already heard, people are avoiding going to the hospital. People are avoiding routine health care and people are avoiding elective procedures. My family certainly is. We are avoiding them because the hospitals are not safe. This is a huge loss in revenue for the hospitals. So you have one choice. You can buy a $40 respirator for each of your staff and train them to use it cheap, or you can face hundreds of millions of dollars in liability, in disabled staff, in costs to replace your disabled staff, in reputational damage, in people avoiding your hospitals because they don't want to get infected. So my professional financial advice as a professional investor with 30 years of financial analysis experience is that every healthcare office ought to be using respirator masks. It is clear economically that this would be profitable. For some reason, they aren't doing it. It should be standard precautions. It should be ordered from the CDC, and there is no reason to give them any discretion because they will all profit from doing it. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comment, Nathaniel. We can move on to the next comment. Brianna, thank you. Peg, Sim Seminario, it is now your turn for public comment. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Peg Seminario. I'm an industrial hygienist and served for 30 years as a safety and health director at the AFL-CIO until my retirement in 2019, uh, where I specialize in occupational safety and health policy and regulatory matters, including work on healthcare worker protections for infectious diseases. I was one of the authors of a letter to CDC Director Mandy Cohen from 900 public health and medical experts in July, expressing great concern about CDC HICPAC's update of the guidelines on isolation precautions, both about the closed non-transparent process and the failure to address and protect against aerosol transmission of infectious diseases. Late Friday, uh, we received a response from CDC to our letter, informed us that HICPAC would not be voting on the recommendations today, um, which we appreciate. But we are deeply dismayed that the CDC response did not address any of our substantive concerns about the weakness of the guidelines, nor provide any indication that CDC or HICPAC intend to open up the guideline development process to involve key experts and stakeholders. We urge you to change course. The majority of HICPAC and work group members are infectious disease professionals from hospitals or large healthcare organizations. They do not include representatives of healthcare workers or patients who have different interests and different views, as we have just heard from many of the commenters. HICPAC members are not experts in aerosol transmission, ventilation, respiratory protection, or industrial hygiene, the kind of experts with deep knowledge and experience on how infectious diseases are transmitted and effectively controlled. For more than three years, we have all been immersed in efforts to protect the public, patients, and healthcare workers from COVID-19 infection and death. We have failed miserably in those efforts. Over 100 million have been affected, infected over a million people have died. In healthcare settings where we don't have a lot of information, we know that hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers and patients have been infected and thousands have died. And today those infections and deaths continue to occur. The latest CDC data from nursing homes reports that since mid-June, the number and rate of nursing home staff infected with COVID has tripled and more than doubled among nursing home residents. COVID deaths among nursing home residents have increased by 60%. In July, deaths among nursing home residents accounted for nearly 20% of all COVID deaths in the United States. 20% of COVID deaths are healthcare infection uh, related. So clearly CDC hospitals infection control professors are still failing to protect healthcare workers and patients. We need to do more. CDC must develop strong infection control guidelines that fully protect against aerosol transmission and open up the development process to include necessary experts and members of the public. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Peg. Move on to the next commenter. Shanae O'Neill, it is now your turn for public comment. Hi, thank you. Yes, I'm Shay O'Neill, a World Health Network volunteer, a patient, disabled rights advocate, sole caretaker of one son, high risk person with disability. And it's quite obvious that your last discussions from meetings did not inspire confidence amongst the public in your ability to, without bias, pass guidance and standards that will deal with the dreadful rise in infections in healthcare facilities. Again, not mentioned today, interestingly. It is really clear in wildfire smoke messaging that you wear N95 respirator masks, that surgical cloth and dust masks aren't gonna cut it. You would never in peak wildfire times amid smoke tell firefighters, vulnerable people, or even healthy people, hey, you know what? I think we need more real world studies. Wear surgicals for now. Or actually, wildfires typically aren't all year long, so we will change the guidance to surgical instead. These things do not make sense. Do not protect people, not for fires, not for COVID-19, both aerosols. The fact that in your past meeting you used widely criticized mass studies failed to mention any with continued use of N95s in healthcare settings studies which show that they do lower infections. The fact that you highlighted mass discomfort and ignored long COVID and how damaging and widespread its effects are. 
I don't know if this is ignorance, immorality, if it's conflict of interest or money or psychological coping at play, but I'll tell you, science and logic are not at the table and they need to be brought back. It is not complex. It is very simple and clear that N95s offer adequate protection from aerosols, that two-way protection is much better than one way, that hospitals are full of vulnerable populations, that doctors should not infect patients, and that healthcare is a human right. We need N95 respirator masks and healthcare facilities to protect both staff and patients. There are many reasons why. This is just a few of them. Studies show that more than half of transmission is from asymptomatic carriers and COVID-19 is airborne and highly contagious. Hospital acquired COVID-19 had a 10% mortality rate for the past year, nearly a third of COVID-19 cases in hospitals in England were um, hospital acquired infections. A 2023 JAMA study on Omicron variants showed that hospital acquired COVID-19 was associated with approximately one and a half higher risk of all cause mortality in hospitals compared with influenza. A 2023 study showed COVID-19 infections make people's existing illnesses worse. Research on viral genomic sequences during COVID-19 outbreak in hospitals demonstrated healthcare workers were responsible for much of the spread in the hospital ward. Long COVID continues to cause severe long-term consequences for millions with one study finding that those that develop long COVID have a 38% chance of developing a disability that prevents them from returning to work. Another indicating that 27% of healthcare workers develop long COVID. While reported acute phase deaths are down, COVID-19 continues to kill and many patients in healthcare settings are high risk for severe COVID-19. I'm one of the people who are high risk and my life depends on getting better protection in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. We'll move on to the next comment. Jocelyn, it is now your turn for public comment. My father is a good man. I'm sorry, my name is Jocelyn Peterson, Jocelyn Donegan Peterson. My father is a good man who always worked hard and gives generously to others. In 2018, he almost died of the flu, which left permanent damage to his heart and lungs. All of his doctors still, still say he can't get COVID. The risk to his life is too great. We and countless others across the nation and globe only go indoors masked in respirators for necessary medical care. It's the only time we go inside. Although my dad can't do many things, he should be safely enjoying in retirement with his grandchildren. We are grateful for crucial tools like effective masks, upgraded ventilation, along with the healthcare workers still taking the most protective measures to help us avoid COVID. What continues to horrify and baffle us is that the only COVID risks we are forced to take are when seeking out medical care. Let me say that again. The only COVID risks we are forced to take with his life and our lives and long-term health are when we need medical care. That statement doesn't even make sense when you say it out loud, and yet that is the tragic and unavoidable reality for us and so many others right now. The exhausting and necessary risk analysis, whether that medical appointment or procedure is worth possibly contracting COVID, the valid anxiety that now accompanies those appointments and distracts from the medical issue care is being sought for, and the people who have already contracted COVID while seeking medical care, None of those things ever get less surreal because the tools exist to reduce the risks. You can make these environments exponentially safer for all, including the brave medical professionals constantly working there. The serious risks of COVID short and long term have already been confirmed and reconfirmed in peer-reviewed studies, and that's not even accounting for what we may continue to learn in the future. Given the lack of effective preventatives and treatments we currently have, more and more people are going to continue to unnecessarily die or be disabled with long COVID or be added to the higher risk pool to where a subsequent COVID infection will kill or disable them. This is unsustainable for our species and our global healthcare systems. We need the updated guidance to be clear and explicit about the precautions that are needed to protect healthcare workers and patients from infectious diseases. And we need consistent messaging to educate the public about the true dangers of COVID and being disabled by long COVID so they understand and support these protocols. We need you to do everything in your power to protect the lives and physical and mental health of all of us. Most importantly, the highest risk amongst us and our precious healthcare workers. My dad and so many real people, children, fathers, mothers, grandparents, husbands, wives, don't deserve to be abandoned and their lives or long-term health put at serious risk just because they need a doctor or a surgery or are fighting cancer or elderly or immunocompromised or work as a healthcare worker trying to help all of those people. You are in a position to help all of them, to help all of us. Please, 
help us. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. We can move on to our next comment. Oliver Wilson, it is now your turn for public comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Oliver Wilson, and I'm a member of Massachusetts Coalition for Health Equity. I'm also a white, queer, and tan trans person, as well as a community organizer and a patient. Today, I'm here to urge HICPAC and CDC to increase transparency and public engagement in the process to update the 2007 Isolation Precautions Guidance. I'd like to share my daily lived reality, just, so, just like many others have done before me. I can no longer safely access healthcare. I have a health condition that, according to the CDC, puts me at higher risk of severe outcomes from COVID. As a result, I cannot safely access healthcare unless healthcare providers, patients, and visitors are wearing masks. Since the end of the federal and state public health emergency on May 13th, all of my healthcare providers have dropped universal masking. Additionally, all of my requests for universal masking as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA have been denied. As a result, I am locked out of healthcare and my federal right and human right to save healthcare is being violated. 200 people from across Massachusetts have signed a public letter saying that they are also locked out of healthcare for the same reason. CDC's disgraceful handling of the ongoing pandemic has directly contributed to myself and many other people being locked out of healthcare. The proposed updates to the 2007 isolation precautions guidance weaken infection control and healthcare settings even further. I urge HICPAC and CDC to increase transparency and public engagement in the process to update the 2007 isolation precautions guidance. So far, CDC and HICPAC's process has been closed to public access or engagement. HICPAC meeting presentations and documents used to make recommendations to the CDC are not posted publicly, in contrast to other federal advisory committees, including those at the CDC. Given the broad public interest in CDC's guidance to protect uh, healthcare personnel, patients, and the public from infectious diseases, it is especially concerning that CDC's HICPAC's process is so closed. I also urge HICPAC to fully recognize aerosol transmission, i.e. inhalation of small infectious particles, to ensure healthcare worker and patient protection, and to mandate universal masking using high quality uh, respirators and 95 or better in all healthcare settings. Today, I join tens of thousands of people across the U.S. to say that we demand care, not COVID. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Oliver. We can move on to the next commenter. Rachel Ween Traub, it is now your turn for public comment. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for providing this opportunity to comment today. My name is Rachel Weintraub, Executive Director of the Coalition for Sensible Safeguards, or CSS. CSS is an alliance of more than 170 consumer, labor, scientific, research, faith, community, environmental, small business, good government, public health, and public interest groups representing millions of Americans. We are joined in the belief that our country's system of regulatory safeguards should secure our quality of life, pave the way for a sound economy, and benefit us all. Federal regulations dealing with food and consumer products, safe air and drinking water, safe working conditions, equal opportunity, and reliable financial structures protect all of us from harm. Failure to provide adequate safeguards diminishes our economic well being, undermines public health and safety, and allows special interests to escape accountability for their actions. We seek to ensure that our critical public protections are not rolled back and that federal agencies have the funding, authority, fair processes in place, and appropriate expertise at the table to defend, promulgate, and strengthen important protections. HICPAC is chartered under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, and should operate with openness and full transparency. It is from this perspective that we urge HICPAC, the CDC, and the relevant work groups to take the following two immediate actions to correct their review and decision-making processes and recommendations. First, seek input on proposed changes during the development of the draft guidelines from the public and all key stakeholders, including healthcare personnel and their representatives, industrial hygienists, occupational health nurses and safety professionals, engineers, including those with expertise in ventilation, design and operation, 
Research scientists, including those with expertise in aerosols and respiratory protection, and experts in respiratory protection. Second, make the process for updating the guidelines fully open and transparent. Open workgroup meetings to the public, through which the workgroup should show the evidence sources being reviewed by the workgroup. Post workgroup reports, all presentations to the workgroup committee, and transcripts, recordings of the HICPAC meetings on the website in a timely fashion. For example, make meetings of the June meetings available to everyone. As the recommendations are being developed and before finalization and voting by HICPAC, we urge HICPAC to create a public docket on the development of the guidelines that includes all meeting minutes, draft guidelines, all scientific evidence used in the development of the guidelines and all written comments from the public. Inform the public in advance when there will be a vote. We thank you for making this public comment possible and urge you to take immediate steps to increase the openness and transparency of this process. Thank you, Rachel. Let's quickly move on to the next um, public comment. Katia Javidan, it is now your turn for public comment. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Javidan, faculty at Stanford University, speaking on behalf of myself as an academic who researches the inequities of pandemic policy um, and who's deeply concerned for loved ones suffering from long COVID or who've been diagnosed with chronic conditions such as cancer during the pandemic, including oral cancers for which they're unable to mask themselves during examinations and treatments. I come before you today to stress the vital importance of ensuring that the updated guidelines being considered fully reflect a solidly scientific understanding of aerosol transmission, especially as confirmed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that they are crafted to fully protect against infectious aerosols. Please take seriously the hundreds of experts in the most relevant fields who have written a well-informed warning against the plan to weaken guidance for healthcare respiratory protection and infection control. Nosocomial COVID has proven deadlier and more dangerous than community acquired COVID with a 10% mortality rate according to the most recent and reliable reports. When healthcare settings are infecting patients while COVID continues to be the third leading cause of death, it deters many from seeking medical care. As someone who insists on high standards of methodology for myself, peers, and students, it is alarming that the CDC and HICPAC process lacks essential input from crucial stakeholders, lacks transparency in public engagement, and encourages minimal standards of protection, which is deeply troubling in light of nosocomial COVID. Experts are urging HICPAC and CDC to open the process for public access and insist on a clear protective approach recognizing the science of aerosol transmission, including inhalation protection. The existing review on N95 respirator versus surgical mask effectiveness is flawed and requires reevaluation with expert guidance. Failure to acknowledge vital control measures like N95 respirators, ventilation and air filtration for controlling exposure to infectious aerosols must be corrected. Rather than regressing backward and erasing pandemic lessons, please maintain and strengthen protocols for prevention and control of aerosolized pathogens in light of SARS-CoV-2. Please center the most vulnerable and understand the unequal and unfair power dynamics of an oral cancer patient having to repeatedly request healthcare personnel to wear an N95 every time they enter the room. Healthcare is a human right. Thank you for your comment. We can move on to the next comment. Zene True Nafo Cortez, it is now your turn for public comment. True Nafo Cortez. We can move on to the next comment. Zefner Almasi, it is now your turn for public comment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hello, my name is Cypher Almasy. I'm a member of the public providing a comment. COVID remains a significant health threat with one in 10 infections leaving people with long-term health impacts. The unchecked prevalence of COVID-19 and other airborne illnesses within our healthcare facilities makes healthcare visits dangerous for everyone, especially higher risk populations, such as immune compromised people, older adults, and people with disabilities. This situation personally impacts me because I do not want to risk long-term health impacts while attending routine healthcare appointments. I'm deeply concerned that a long-term health, health impact will take away my access to li livelihood and my hobbies. Uh, unfortunately, I have experienced skepticism, denial, and hostility while advocating for my own safety to healthcare providers. Hours of phone calls, emails, and research regarding the infection control policies of my local healthcare providers con conclude with no assurance that providers will wear respirators to protect me. At times, it has been up to me to educate my healthcare providers on the importance of infection control via respirators. It should not be up to any patient to plead for their own safety. Most hospitals in my state were protecting patients from COVID with universal masking protections from the start of the pandemic, but essentially all the hospitals in the state withdrew these protections abruptly this spring. Reinstating universal masking would help ensure that we leave no one behind in accessing healthcare. It would also create safer workplaces for our healthcare workers. Therefore, CDC HIP hack she must take action to protect patients, healthcare workers, and visitors to healthcare facilities. CDC HICPAC must fully recognize aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory pathogens. Additionally, CDC HICPAC must maintain and strengthen respiratory protection and other protections for healthcare workers caring for patients with suspected or confirmed respiratory infections. Also, the CDC must maintain an approach in any updated infection control guidance that is clear and explicit on the precautions that are needed in situations where infectious pathogens are present or may be present in healthcare settings. Don't adopt a crisis standards approach. Finally, CDC HICPAC should engage with stakeholders, including direct care healthcare workers, their unions, patients, and community members to provide them with the ability to review and provide essential input into uh, guidance updates. I think it's pretty clear to all of you that my comments are on the same theme as everyone else who's spoken to this meeting. Do better, I yield my time. Thank you for your public comment, Cypher Almasi. We have, um, our public comment period has now come to a close. I would like to thank all those who were able to provide public comment and would like to remind everyone else that you can submit your written public comment at hickpac at cdc.gov. I would like to pass it over to Sharon Wright. Thanks, Sydney. I'd like to thank all of the presenters and everyone who participated in today's meeting. Uh, so uh, what we talked about today, first we heard from Mike Bell providing an update on DHQP, including a continuation of Alex Kalin's discussion of the HICPAC guideline process, particularly as related to the isolation guideline. He also mentioned that CDC is working on a respiratory viral index to capture information on incidents of several respiratory viruses with a hope to have this available before the traditional respiratory viral season starts in earnest this fall. Next, we heard an update on the isolation uh, work group, specifically on EBP and standard precautions. There was an informative discussion of enhanced barrier precautions on indications for use for residents with infection or colonization with a multi-drug resistant organism, including considerations for residents uh, at high risk for MDRO colonization, regardless of their MDRO status, such as those with indwelling medical devices. And there was a, a comment raised about use in other congregate settings as well. There was also a discussion of the change from implementation of contact precautions upon room entry to the use of the term designated patient space to apply more easily to all healthcare settings. And we will bring that back to the work group for discussion of the language in this section. The evolution and contents of standard precautions were described. Uh, we talked about core practices being the home for standard precautions with a focus on application by frontline staff as well as where to place certain components um, and a discussion around naming. If anyone uh, from HICPAC has additional suggestions, please send them uh, to Mike Glenn or I. Um, the uh, HCP guideline, we heard an update uh, from Colleen Kraft about the great progress on the guideline uh, for infection control in healthcare personnel, section two. The measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella have completed CDC clearance and are posted in the Federal Register for comments until September 15th. The pregnant healthcare personnel section stating that healthcare personnel should not be routinely excluded from work based only on the basis of their pregnancy receive one favorable comment and the vote will be deferred to the next meeting due to lack of quorum. Several other pathogens are either on deck in literature view or having scope defined. 
Next, we heard from Aaron Kaufman about the uh, U.S. Public Health Service Occupational Post-Exposure Prophylaxis Guideline, which was last updated in 2013. Um, new recommendations included draft changes to the preferred um, HIV post-exposure prophylaxis regimens, as well as alternative HIV PEP regimens, and those for special populations, including recipients with kidney disease and for pregnant healthcare personnel. Um, and there was a discussion about uh, recommendations for PEP um, in exposures to source patients with HIV with undetectable viral load, um, and an update to recommendations for lab testing. The guideline will undergo public comment in the Federal Register in September or October when it's ready and working towards publication in February 2024. And finally, we heard from Aaron Kaufman again on the patient placement and PPE recommendations for selected viral hemorrhagic fevers. At the June meeting, the committee had requested additional clarification on Andes and Nipah viruses, um, and the recommendations were put forward for Andes uh, virus and also clinically stable suspect cases of NEPA to require gown, gloves, eye protection, and an N95 respirator or higher level of respiratory protection and use of an AIIR. And the recommendation for either confirmed NEPA virus or clinically unstable suspect cases of NEPA were proposed to use PPE according to the clinically unstable VHF guidance. Members expressed appreciation for the detailed work and the simpler, more easily implementable guidance to keep healthcare personnel safe. The vote will be deferred to the next meeting due to lack of quorum. Sydney, I'll turn it back to you to close the meeting. You're muted, Sydney. Thank you for that, Sharon. The time is 2.29. Um, and we are ready to adjourn. I want to thank everyone for joining, and we will see everyone in November. Thank you. Thank you.